Welcome everybody to Drum Education Live, episode 54. And today we have Ian Palmer with us. Oh. Yeah! Well, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for inviting me along as well. Oh, Thank pleasure. you for turning up. Yes. No, that's great. I want to ask you about uh, drumming education and mm. if you think anything is missing today from drumming education. That's a really, really good question, actually. You could have sent me these questions beforehand. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, is any, yeah, do you know what I think is missing? And, um, you know, something we just alluded to, actually, and something which I really miss. And this is something which used to happen 20 years ago. And that's drum clinics in the back of a pub where we all get together, we hang out, we, talk, we geek out, we talk about drums, obviously, we talk, we play with the backing tracks and, you know, and it's really quite, it was quite humbling then. But of course today, I think maybe because of the internet, everything's available on YouTube to us, but I miss those days. You know, I saw some fantastic drum clinics with people in literally in the back of a pub or a, a social club room. You know, I remember seeing Virgil Donati when he sort of first, um, sort of appeared on the scene and um, I think you know I said to you guys I was so fortunate to support Don Famularo as a young boy sort of 30 years ago doing a little tour around the UK for drum shops and I just think it's you know again it's probably the internet isn't it that has sort of YouTube has taken over now it's so available to people but also the way drum drums are sold now is different mm. that's online of course and that's been a challenge for drum shops so you know that's what i'd like to see that's what i think's missing when when was your last drum clinic um my last drum clinic was um i guess it was a drum clinic it was the london drum show in okay. 2017 and it was myself and um we're not worthy mike clark on the main wow. stage which is fantastic. Nice. And, you know, Mike is somebody that I've known and has been, has been a hero of mine. And for, you know, since I, as far as, as long as I can remember, you know, those early albums with um, Herbie Hancock and I had I put a band together. We got on stage and we played, I think some of the footage actually is on YouTube. Um, but I got to play actual proof, double drums cool. with Mike Clark. Nice. You know, how cool is that? I was like, whoa, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, but so that, but that, that that was a, a special drumming event, which you know people will go anyway. We hope, but uh, like the like the old the the old school clinics at the back of a pub or or in a um, drum shop. When do you remember when the last one was? I do, and I've got a friend of mine who is a great ambassador for drumming in this country, in the UK, and that is um, Matty Roberts, who actually has been doing a series of interviews with um, world famous drummers um, online, and it's called Northwest uh, Drum Promotions. But Matty has been putting occasionally these drum clinics on. So I did, Steve White did the very first one. He's had Steve Lyman, Kaz Rodriguez. I was, uh, I think he's had Ralph Salmons. I was fortunate enough to do one. So that would have been the last drum clinic. And that was maybe three years ago. Okay. Mm. And that was, and Matty did a great job. He's in this little town in North Wales called Hollywell which has maybe the population of about 150 people. It's really small, but it has one hotel, one which is sort of the focal point just off the dual carriageway there. And, um, and Matty consistently gets a couple of hundred people, drummers along to little, you know, girlfriends and boyfriends of drummers along and to, um, to, to, to watch. And it's, it's amazing. And he's done such a great job. Maybe. So that, that was, Maybe in a small town, it's easier because London, we're spoiled for choice. You know, there's so much going on in London, all the, yeah, forget pandemic, obviously, but you know, it's so much going on all the time that it's really, you know, why anyone true, would actually. go, you know, to a drum clinic. That's so yeah. true. I've, um, I, over the last 12 years have been running a drum event, um, sort of sporadically, I've, I've done 10 events called the world's greatest drummer, which actually initially, uh, my background is in playing jazz music with 
and big bands and Buddy Rich was a huge, as we knew, he's a huge influence um, on me as, um, along with everybody else. And um, I had this idea in 2007 to put a drum event together and I decided to call it, which probably actually in hindsight was probably not a great name, but I decided to call it the World's Greatest Drummer Concert. Uh, because it can be misconstrued, but actually it's effectively a tribute to Buddy Rich with Pete Cater's big band, Steve White, Pete Cater and myself, and generally um, uh, an, an American actually guest. And so we've had uh, Steve Smith, Keith Carlock, we had Benny Greb on the last one, Steve Gadd. Um, so they have been great. They, they've been really good, fun events to, to put on. But you mentioned about London and uh, Fleet, and um, I was hoping to put the, the event on in London. But when I looked into it, I was thinking to myself, well, how is this going to work now? You know, we've got, um, you know, we've got Dave Weckl in town, we've got Steve Gadd playing a week at Ronnie Scott's, you know, here and very close by, we've got Harvey Mason playing at the chapel in Islington. You know, we are really spoiled for your choice in, in the southeast, that's for sure. You're, you're totally right. Bring them, bring them here, Essex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there is an imbalance, though, isn't there? That's for sure. You know, you've got you know Matty in the in the northwest, and which you know they they get gigs in Manchester, of course, but it's not. It's yeah. definitely not evenly spread. Of course, it's not. You know, it is. It is, it is a challenge. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I I hopefully think this is all going to change anyway uh, when things go back to normal because I'm hoping everyone will be like let's let's do this let's do some clinics let's get yeah. drummers out we're, there we're and... tired of watching YouTube for everything yeah yeah <laughs> thank exactly you. thank you do you know what I've been doing while I, you're t talking about YouTube and um, I've been really fortunate during this last 14 months to be able to study with different people now financially it's sort of got a little bit more challenging of course because you know it's very difficult to make money um, just teaching or you know just doing the occasional session but when I've, when possible I've been taking drum lessons with different people online and a couple of the people that I've managed to um, study with well one in particular David Garibaldi absolutely amazing and he had a really interesting and anyone that's you know watching tap david up he's fantastic he's one of the most um thoughtful inspiring teachers you know dom is equally in that category but david approaches it in a very different way but he had some very interesting points to make and what he said to me was back in the 70s when he was doing sort of sessions um, after his what well, during the time of um, the first time with the tower of power he was saying that actually in the bay area we didn't of course we didn't have they didn't have youtube you know he said it was very uncool to copy each other you know this copying this um you know and the, the way we all sort of jump on the fact that we're all going to use, you know, these stacks or we're going to, you know, in the 80s, the eight and the 10 inch racks on like Dave Weckl, we all started to copy everyone so closely. So in the 70s, he was saying, man, that was so uncool. So I used to have my friends like Mike Clark. In fact, David has got this thing uh, now online called the Stick Men with uh, Michael Shreve. And they've been doing some interviews as a collective group. But he said, these are all of his friends from sort of way back. He said, so they used to support each other, but because there was only sort of vinyl at that time, he said it was a really creative time because we couldn't go onto YouTube. But what you could do is listen to the vinyl, but you would never know exactly what drum set they were using or what cymbal set up or this and that, or what drum heads and, you know, it wasn't as if everyone was just going to go and start using pinstripes because that's the, the cool thing to do at the moment. You know, they didn't know. But what it did, it made everyone a whole lot more creative because you had to use your imagination. And that was David's big thing, which I thought was actually, do you know what? I, I thought that was really quite inspiring. It is. Yeah, true. Definitely. Definitely. I think that's it's such a common thing to hear from students is like, Oh, well, or them to feel a bit like unsure about being creative. How do mm. I be creative or what, what am I supposed to do? And, mm. you know, take, don't look at someone else, just look inward, you know, and see, yeah, see it. what yeah. comes, you know. Well, this was another thing which I was saying to David was that um, 
I said, oh, this is my, this is my Dave Weckl lick, or this is my Benny Greb lick, or this is my Mark Giuliano thing. And in the end, he was saying, you know, for, for heaven's sake, will you stop mentioning other drummers? That's an Ian Palmer thing. That's you. Mm. And I said, well, I've got to stop playing these licks. You know, I want to kind of get out playing these licks. I want to be, you know, really cool man because I just want to be in the moment and just play. He said, what are you talking about? I said, they aren't licks. That's your vocabulary. That's your voice. He said, and what you do is you work okay. with that voice and you expand it. And I thought, wow. So every before every lesson, he was saying to me, what I want you to do, I've actually got a lot better with Sibelius during this last 14 months and transcribing. He said, I'd like you to write down your five, for the first lesson, write down your five favorite licks. And I thought, okay. And I just scribbled it down on a piece of paper. And he was like, are you serious about this? You know, you know, I'm not getting the impression you're very serious. You know, there's, you're playing accents, you're playing grace notes. I want to see exactly written down what it, what, it, what you're playing, written down precisely. And I was like, whoa, okay, this is really quite serious. So what he was doing was saying, take those so-called Mark Giuliano licks, Benny Greb, Steve Gadd, whatever, make them your own, turn them around, start them on beat two, make them into three, four, make the 16th note triplets or whatever, make, just change the meter, do something. And really his expression was, take a deep dive. And I thought, wow. I love that. Yeah. Now yeah. I'm inspired to have a lesson with him. Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm I'm his agent. So I'm David. I've taken twenty percent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, but I, but and but then you know other teachers, Dom, who is sort of my my go to um, in, in, inspiration. Really, Dom has a different approach. Dom takes what he sees on the day, and you know we work through various books, but we go we take a deep dive into Moller. Or we take a deep dive, you know, the big thing for me, actually, was trying to develop my foot technique. And, you know, and everyone thinks, well, why do you want to do that? You know, you play, a, you, most gigs, you know, you get hired to play, do, da, do, do, da, or do, da, get, do, da, if you're lucky. Well, actually, by working on my feet, I found actually my hands feel so much better. And that sounds really odd, but everything seems to work really nicely together. Um, uh, so Dom is different, but Dom is also equally as inspiring, but gets different areas. I want to talk about your playing uh, a bit more, but I really want to know a bit more about how you got into it and the early days of you mm. drumming. I've, I've got two uncles who play drums. Uh, one is um, Steve Palmer and the other is Carl Palmer, who um, played for the, the Emerson Lake and Palmer in the 70s and the Asia and all of that. So he's, um, more, he, in fact, the, the funny thing is all three of us play with the sort of very different styles, really different influences. Um, so I got into drumming initially, I think, well, obviously, thanks to my two uncles. And um, yeah, every body always talks about that moment that they were inspired to pick up the drumsticks you know you you often read about a lot of the great american drummers say it was the ed sullivan show in 1964 watching ringo star and the moment for me was watching my uncle carl play on a vhs video on christmas uh, for a vhs video that i think my brother had bought for my father um of emerson lake and palmer playing at montreal olympic stadium and, you know, this, of course, was the days where, you know, today it's, it's more about solo artists, isn't it, and singers, but that was very much the days of bands, which is great. And, you know, it must have been amazing to play for a band where actually the name of the band you know, features your surname <laughs> and you get to play a big drum solo. So I saw Cole playing this, you know, his big drum solo and he's doing all this kind of crazy stuff with the gongs and um, taking his shirts off, which I thought, yeah, what are you doing? But <laughs> that, was a little, that was a bit which wasn't quite so inspiring. <laughs> well, uncles are in the world to embarrass us, so he was doing that. <laughs> Yeah, people loved it. So he's on a lot of records. But I just thought that, that was the moment for me that I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do. I said to my dad, so um, um, we spoke to Carl and he arranged um, a, I got a drum set from Premier, an old Premier Resonator drum ah. set, which we set up in my bedroom at home and uh, my parents and I think you've got to have really understanding parents as well at a young <laughs> age because I was, you know, I was playing these drums and I played them and played them and played them and actually I was really focused I loved it 
you know, I'd really loved to play from a young age, um, but my neighbors didn't love it quite so much. So they were really, even the double glazing on these windows didn't really kind of work that well. Um, but my poor parents, you know, my mum cooking dinner and all, all she could hear was dun, dun, da, dun, dun, da, dun, dun, da. <laughs> it must have been awful actually. Um, so yeah, that was the moment I started to get into playing. And did Carl have a, did he have a, like a close, um, I don't know, watch eye over what you were doing or um, or not? Or did you just kind of go, I want to kind of do it in my, my own way? No, Carl was, um, Carl is even today, well, not at the moment, of course, during the last 14 months, but Carl is, um, you know, what he describes himself, he said he's a road rat, you know, he's out playing, that's what he does, Carl will be 72, and, you know, he just, he just plays 260 gigs a year, you know, and that's what he does. And that's what he's done consistently. So he's got his own band now. He was out with Emerson, Lake and Palmer, and I started playing. It was all about Asia. And uh, so Carl wasn't really around. We spoke occasionally, but he was just, this is what he does. He's just out on the yeah. road. Um, but my uncle Steve, who was at home, very local to us, was amazing. And he sat down with me and was teaching me about Elvin Jones and about Jack DeJanet and Steve Gadd and all of these great players. So that was really, um, that was really inspiring. So, um, so Steve was around initially, but actually as we've got, gotten older now, I, um, you know, I, I live more locally to Carl actually, and Carl's at home and he's getting really fed up with being stuck at home. He just wants to go out and play, you know, but we, we speak, I speak to, to both uncles now in equal measures. He gave you the drum kit, but that was as far as he yeah. went. Exactly. <laughs> you, 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 yes, very perceptive. That was exactly it. Here's the drum kit. It's your problem now. Bye. Yeah, exactly. Although I will say that I had, a, I, I think it was important as well at the early days to have, you know, this is, we're talking about drum education, but the importance of having, you know, a good drum teacher early on to get yeah. you set on the right track. Um, there's maybe arguments for and against it, but for me it worked quite well because it kept me really focused on on what I was what I was doing. You know, there's there's so many great drummers that are self-taught. So, mm. you know, Buddy Rich arguably I think was pretty much self-taught, wasn't he? So, yeah, but um, I I think Buddy Rich doesn't count. He was from another <laughs> planet. It's like you know. I agree. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. He's yeah. Else. So it's um so it's been an interesting. It was an interesting start for my career um, in drumming um, and but I think you know parents supportive parents was was a big big part of it yeah. you know my poor dad used to drive me around loading the drums into the back of the car you know loading the drums into the house and the wind and the rain when we got home at night I had to get to bed to go to school and, and all of that so that was the thing and you know arguing with the teachers and explaining why I hadn't done my homework because I was out doing gigs and so but my parents really understood this is what this is what I wanted to do so that's so nice it's like mm. you know what a lovely foundation and what I really love about your playing I just think it's so I'm going to be a bit fan girly, just sorry, but I really love your playing. You're just, your dynamics is just beautiful. Like everything, your flow is just wonderful. Like every time I watch your posts and stuff, I'm just like, oh, it's just so tasteful, you know, it's just beautiful. And I wondered if you have any like tips for, for people who want to develop their feel and how to make it feel as so, nice. Yeah, um, I've got, I've had, I do have a tip and I learned a big lesson actually. I mentioned about Steve Gadd and it has to be all about the music. I really appreciate what you just said, by the way, it's really kind, thank you. And likewise, you know, listening to you play, it's amazing. Oh, so, no. so, so, so I said so she you. has big heavyweight fans thank in this place. Yeah, Philippe. yeah. So we've so everyone has something to offer, but mm. you know, I I've got to be honest with you, and I, and I will be really brutally honest that I have I have doubts about my playing. I do I really do? And I tell you why, because you see so many guys who are so technically technically accomplished, ripping, tearing around the drums, you know, and the speed in which they play now with the combinations of doubles on the bass drum snare drum yeah. and the toms and everything i mean it's pretty frightening the physical side of it 
Um, and I think, you know, is what I is what I do relevant now? Is that where it is? Is that what it's no, all about? No. But, <laughs> but then I think about people like. But then I come back to Steve Gadd, and there's. Um, I was fortunate enough. Now I organised the concert, so it wasn't exactly as if I was the guy who was called to do the gig. But I organised the concert with Steve, and I always wanted to play alongside him. And I, you know going to do the live streams we have this thing called the steve gad swear box because every time i mention steve gad i have to put a pound in the <laughs> box <laughs> um, but how much is in what? there now um, well we bought put a house off shortly with it <laughs> um, no but the thing was on that concert and i've got to tell you i've got to tell you about it because that was one of the biggest learning experiences ever so Steve wanted to do a rehearsal. So we organized a rehearsal. We got the band there. And for those that have met Steve or know of Steve, will just know how much sort of karma there is, how calm he is and you know how relaxed and zen-like he is. And so I got up there and I was playing this um, big band piece called um, Time Check, which is pretty, pretty full-on piece written by the great tenor saxophonist Don Menzer, um, who um, actually was the father of the, the late great drummer Nick Menzer. Um, anyway, so I get up there, and so I'm going, and I'm thinking I'm Buddy Rich and getting this hi-hat thing going, and um, but now, and I can see Steve just sitting there in the yard, his drum tech sitting there, and a White is sitting there. No and pressure. Pete's sitting there, and they're all sitting there. But the problem is because I'd organized the concert, you know, it made sense that I had to get the ball rolling. So I did the little rehearsal first. So I get this one, two, two, da, ba, 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 da, 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 So I'm doing that thing. So I'm so I I get to the end of it and um and I'm ripping around the drums, I'm getting all this stuff going. And <laughs> and Steve Pete Yard and um, Steve White still sitting there. <laughs> and, and, um, anyway, so I, I get to the end, you know, expecting to you know, get a round of applause. Fantastic. Of course, it's not like that. We're doing a rehearsal. Um, so anyway, I said, Steve, um, Steve Gad, uh, do you want to come up and um, just play, play with the band? So Steve's drums are there next to mine. And um, anyway, so Steve gets up in his usual way and says hi guys uh, sits down gets the brushes out and all of a sudden you could feel the temperature drop and steve goes okay we're going to play this piece called um basically um basically blues it's a slow burn slow uh, blues piece anyway bat, 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 uh. so steve's thinking like this and he counts the band in one Two, oh, one, two, three, gash, 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 and the band are just playing it, and you can see the band just felt relaxed. You could see that the temperature in the room came down. You could see straight away that actually it was just the joy, and it was a very much one of those moments when I just thought, what's it all about? You know, I'm just ripping around the drums, effectively thinking it's great, but actually, it was it was as if I was being competitive, and it was not about music, and so it was a big lesson learned because actually, what Steve did was like listening to a record. There was sort of a zen about it. There was something really beautiful about it. The time was spot on. The trumpets were playing quite loud actually, and they were sort of getting a little bit behind where Steve was, and uh, I kind of try and do Steve's voice, but he was really cool, because he just stopped and he said, hey guys, can you hear me okay? And they were looking over, he said, listen, the beat's only ever in one place. You just stick with me, it's all cool, okay? So let's just run it from there again. Ready, one, two, oh, one, two, three, jazzing, good, dun, ba, ba, dun, and you just played that on the cymbal and it was so beautiful and it was just like the biggest lesson in the world it was just like you know that is where it's at and it was just so i think the word is appropriate yeah and it just made everyone feel good and what i was doing just made everyone feel on edge 
because it was really sort of competitive and it was really sort of, I really want to show Steve what I can do. And I'm like the excited little kid doing all this stuff, you know, whether it was, whether it was good or whether it wasn't actually was, is pretty irrelevant because it made people feel uncomfortable. And there's that lovely expression that um, I think Jeff Picara used to use and he used to refer to antisocial drumming. And, um, and that's probably what it was because it was pretty antisocial. Why? Because it just made everyone feel uncomfortable. And probably the reason why Steve is arguably, you know, the most emulated drummer in the world through the way his lineage has passed to so many different styles and how many gigs he's got and how many people want to work with him is actually probably testament to the fact that it's all about the music and it's not about the ego. And that was a big, big, big lesson. That was the biggest lesson, actually. Didn't didn't need to pay for a drum lesson. I just had to be there. <laughs> uh, but, you know, yeah, after 50 years, he's still pretty much in, in demand. So, you know, mm. I think that speaks volumes. But then I wanted, I, want, I wanted to ask you, because you said sometimes you doubt your drumming. But my question yeah. is, has your, obviously, the pandemic doesn't count, but has your phone stopped ringing? For gigs no it hasn't no it so, hasn't there you I've go been, I've, I've been lucky <laughs> yeah i've been lucky because you know i'm not the greatest drum teacher in the world i'm not um i wish i was better at that um but i love talking about drums um but i've been fortunate enough to probably purely by by being in this area here in the southeast but i've been able to do some sessions during this during this period as well and the sessions have been okay so I work a lot at um, the studio called Master Chord, which is really lovely. And I've got a lovely live room there. So I've been, been down there and um, I've been working actually, interestingly, a friend of mine, I've been working uh, with a, a producer and a writer and arranger called um, Glenn Kalis, whose brother is Erwin Kalis. And we've been, um, we've done a couple of documentaries for um, TV, um, for the uh, Smithsonian channels. So we did all the music for that. So that's been a real blessing. And um, we've just written, uh, well, I've, I've had a, a small contribution to it, but Glenn's just written, and I play drums on it, a, uh, a musical um, production for Netflix, which is nice. amazing. So, so that's been really good. So awesome can cool. you tell tell us about your little setup you've got a studio there or a room yeah uh, it's it's, well, it's just literally um <laughs> it's just a practice little setup um and i've got to do my live streams from there but it's just mesh heads and um one thing which is big we live in a semi-detached house so the neighbors next door they're quite um yeah, they're quite a loud family, so that's quite a good thing. So that gives me, so when they, you know, so if I'm playing the drums, I can say, yeah, well, you, you slam the front door and your kids run up and down the stairs and they're screaming and shouting. So, uh, so bedlam breaks loose until the curfew at 8 p.m. <laughs> um, so, yeah, my drum setup here is, is basically, I thought about using electronic drums here and going down that route. And I still am toying with the idea of it. But the thing that's making me hold back from that at the moment is the well, A, the volume has to be kept down. So that would have been, that would be fine probably with the electronic sets, MIDI sets. Um, but I have to, I feel I want to kind of reproduce my live set here. So all the yeah. positions are exact. And so I've got a Yamaha um, hybrid set. And a Yamaha recording custom set, and I kind of change them around sometimes, use one or the other live, but the other one then goes into the drum room. And so they're all set up identically. So I've got mesh heads, uh, Remo silent stroke heads on the top. They use the clear ambassadors on the bottom, so you still get a little bit of the, the note from it. Um, but one thing I've learned is with the mesh heads, which is a bit of a drag, is if you hit the rim, it can throw the internal dynamics a little bit. So what I do, I use this thing, which is made by a company called Shure called Rim Wrap, which is you just put this rubber rim wrap all around the edge. So it brings the volume of the, the hoops down a little bit, uh, which is works really well with the internal dynamics. The other thing I use is the Zildjian LAT uh, silent, well, 80% quiet uh, cymbals. Now oh. that's quite good because in comparison to the drums, they're really loud. 
um, as if you were to put, you know, if you were to say that these symbols are just louder, as if if, if a proper acoustic set, the symbols would be a lot quieter in comparison to the to the drums. So what it does actually, which has helped me a little bit, it's helped me to play the symbols just a bit more quietly because I try and get the internal dynamics correct on that set. So actually, it's, it's kind of helped me. I know some people have like a downer on mesh heads saying they're really responsive and it's not natural. It doesn't feel like a proper drum set. But in some ways, for me, I, I don't really play that loud. You know, I keep the volume down, but I try and keep everything, all the dynamics really quite nice within whatever I'm playing on. So it's that's what I use. So I've also got one of those Yamaha um, EAD-10 drum modules oh yeah so they're great because i've got some triggers on each of the drums as well so if i want to i can trigger different sounds and and i also played with the l80 cymbals to make them sound a little less kind of the bell sounding so the 18 i got some rivets and put some rivets in the cymbal on the hi-hats then i put some gaffer tape on the because they were a bit clanky so i put some gaffer tape on the bottom of them and particularly around the bell um, I'm using some of those SIM pads, the big ones on the bottom, so that you sort of mute the symbols just a little bit. And um, and that, and I used to use one of the rivet chains as well on the ride symbol. So they just resonate just a little bit more, but they feel a little bit more like um, I'm playing an acoustic set, a bit more musical, I think. So with the triggers on the EAD-10, which can trigger different sounds, I mean, they're not perfect, and so I certainly... Um, I think the AD10 is brilliant. It's a great tool. It's, you can. It takes basically. It's the old-fashioned way of micing. So the microphone is actually on the on the module, which clips on to the um, bass drum hoop on the batter side. So when you play, you can effectively take your acoustic set, and you can change it into whatever you want, and it changes the whole sound. So it's basically it's a uh, a module effectively. But it's uh, it's a good it's a good tool, you know. It's hmm. good for what I'm using here. Um, cool. Yeah, what, Are you working on anything in particular in terms of practice? I am. Good. I am. Can you I can am. you tell us, or is it yeah. a secret? No, I'd love to tell you. Yeah, yeah. I'm really inspired, and and you know, I saw saw a lot of what Kiara does on uh, online on Instagram. So I've um, there's lots of great drummers on Instagram. There's one person in particular that I've been really inspired by recently who seems to have appeared from, in my opinion, has appeared from nowhere and is amazing. And that's some Justin Scott. Oh, yes. And I think Justin is amazing. He's got such a lovely, and there's this expression, which I think, um, I feel like I'm like an old man now at the age of 45, but this expression, which I do buy into, flow, um, which I think is right. And he's got this lovely kind of flow thing. And one of the things that I got from him, which is in combination with um, my discussions with Don Famulara, um, working on my feet so I sort of one stage I was just working on my feet then I was just working on my hand technique on the practice pad but now I'm trying to combine the two and what Justin does really nicely I think is combine the doubles and particularly the singles between the bass drum and, 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 and hands so getting all of that going so I'm at the moment I'm working on stick control and pages five six and seven now i know no one ever gets past pages five six and seven <laughs> <laughs> just do those to death <laughs> um, i know i'm watching <laughs> so everyone, does, everyone does pages five six and seven um so i've been doing it with my feet and working through them but then i've been doing this exercise called vamps which is a thing which i got from morello years ago which is an endurance exercise for the hands so you play through the two bars of eight notes, then repeat them. And I'm playing them at about, about 80 beats per minute at the moment. But what I do then, because exercise number one, which is just right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, finishes with the left hand, you play the repeat just on the left hand. So once you've repeated it just on the left hand and you go to exercise number two, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, finishes on the right, you play the repeat then just on the right hand. Uh, so if you get to like exercise, I know, like number six, which is like the inverted paradiddles, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, then you play the repeat just on the left hand. So I've been doing that with my feet, which has been really good. But then the other thing that I've really been working on is um, I've been trying to, now this is interesting, um, that you see, and you see a lot of guys playing the, the hi-hat when they've got this bouncing foot thing going on and they're kind of bouncing the whole thing. I've been really yeah. trying to practice, just for practice purposes, 
really controlling both feet by playing heels down and actually then trying to and, you, and eventually you get a real pain in your shins you know you really start to ache after a while my shins actually have sort of um sort of grown quite a lot and sort of got muscle <laughs> for the first way, which is which is good but this is what this is a really good exercise of playing heels down but playing everything heels down so if i so the other thing i've been doing is playing the hi-hat on two and four but i've been playing the uh, which morello was great at the heel and toe technique Mm. So, as opposed to the bouncing leg technique, so uh, which the bouncing leg technique is is okay, but I do feel, but the the bouncing leg thing sometimes I think you can lose control with it because mm. it actually is just going on like a continual motion thing, isn't it? There you, go. you know, doing it as opposed to actually controlling every note. So. I'm controlling every foot by every left foot by playing the heel and toe technique, but then playing, and then playing the bass drum in between every sticking. So da 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 da, which is quite hard. I'm also demonstrating playing traditional grip. I've changed exclusively to match grip. Oh really? Years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So everything's match grip. But so yeah. So play da 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 then playing the and then playing the hi hat there, and that's quite a tick, quite a challenge. Now that's okay, before that you accuse me gone. of plagiarism, before you accuse me of plagiarism, I just this <laughs> afternoon I recorded a video doing exactly that. So if you see that on my Instagram, don't come. Hey, that was my idea. No, sorry. <laughs> It's just plagiarism. I've been doing this for years, man. What are you doing? <laughs> because there is somebody, I'm not going to say who it is, who accused me of copying. So, you know, I just want to be upfront. It's not me. No, of course not. I'll, I'll, play, I'll play you the clip. I'll play. It's on YouTube. I'll play you the clip. But I think that's a really difficult exercise. And I'll tell you what, tell you what inspired me to start doing that was that um, I saw Justin doing a version of that online as a lesson. He didn't do it quite the same way, but I wondered how I could incorporate stick control into it. But what I saw is an Adam Deitch made a comment at the bottom and he said, man, that's like one of the hardest things you can do actually and keep control. So I thought, well, I'm not going to waste time. I need to practice the stuff which is really difficult. You know, I can't mm. you know, I have limited time during the day. Um, even though we're not doing very much at the moment, the job seems to, to mount up. So I just thought, well, what do I need to do in order? I guess there's a difference, isn't there, between at one time my practicing used to be, well, I've got to do two hours a day or three hours a day or four hours a day, of which maybe 30 minutes of that was productive, actually, mm -hmm. when you look back. Now the aim is to try and say, well, I need to just accomplish this. So my practicing now is hopefully more intelligent you know that i need to just work on this so i go for the really hard things even though it's probably not particularly exciting and then give myself you know an equal amount of time at the end and so if i practice this stuff for half an hour then half an hour of just trying to be creative and think about other ideas as our mutual friend don would always say you get on the gig the hands are working great um but feet you better work when i tell you you know how many people yeah. actually really think about that <laughs> exactly exactly mm. You're a pilot as well. Well, well I was. <laughs> well, I was once upon a time many years ago. Yeah, when I was a young man. Yeah. Uh, Fourteen yeah, months ago, man. I was. Yeah, 14, <laughs> 14 months ago, I was. Uh, I was a pilot. Yeah, I was working for um, uh, Virgin Atlantic. But um, as um, as fate would have it, I was made redundant. Mm. So. Um, and I must admit, that's one of the things I've always considered, actually, is uh, I've always worked really hard at my playing. And I've always worked every day, even though I'm flying. I always think it's always been a, always made me wonder when you hear guys say during the last 14 months, oh, man, I haven't even picked up a pair of sticks in 12 months. And as if it's like something to be proud of. And I'm thinking, man, I was even when I was flying airplanes, I was still working really hard at my playing every day and keeping that routine going. So, um, so yeah, it's been a blessing in some ways that I haven't been flying over the last 14 months. Now, whether I go back to it or whether I don't, I'm spiritual in my outlook. You know, the universe will 
guide me in that direction. But at the moment, I really feel that you know my playing is is really important to me. And, yeah. uh, but do you miss I feel like a, uh, I do, I do. Yeah, but at the moment, well, the the truth is actually I do now. I'm trying to arrange my life so I have more time to to fly airplanes, but at the same time have the financial the income to be able to pay a mortgage. Um, mm. So. I do. Um, I'm an examiner and an instructor on um, Airbus Airbus A330 and A320 aircraft now. So I do that on a freelance basis occasionally. I get called to um, go to the simulator and sign people's licenses for another year to keep them current. So cool. Which is quite a nice job, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, what's the chances? A eh? you know, a drummer and a pilot in the middle of a pandemic. You know. As if, as if the world needs either right now. Yeah, <laughs> oh. yeah. yeah I, I don't know about pilots, but I don't think the world needs more drummers. Yeah, I know. It <laughs> made me laugh. I saw Peter, Peter Erskine's um, Facebook. He really makes me laugh. He's saying that, um, yeah, I mean, this evening I'm going to... I'm gonna re I'm gonna release my um, my brand new drum solo um, on an advert for Tama Drums. Said uh, it's a, another drum solo, as if the world needs another drum solo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've heard I've heard that uh, Murray Spivak, that you know, that was the, the teacher mm -hmm. who created the Spivak method. Uh, he never wrote the book, and some and when, whenever somebody would ask, why don't you write a book about your method? And like this, this was like 60, 70 years ago. He used to say, there are enough drum books in the world. The world doesn't need another drum book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nowadays, uh, any schmuck has a drum book, including this one here. So <laughs> well, I'm working on one as well. So I'm going to join the club very soon. But yes. unfortunately, but unfortunately, there's a very, very special drum book that's just been released, isn't there? Gadiments. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. And how amazing. So I'm waiting for my coffee when I want to order, order the coffee. So I can't wait to get it and um, start working through that and start annoying Kirsty more than I would do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was actually going to ask about um, your live streams yeah. that you said you've been doing. A uh, bit more info about that so people, people want yeah. to tune so in. Yeah, every, so every Friday, Ian Palmer Drummer Facebook page. It's a Facebook Live. Um, and it's interesting in as much as what I have now is like a community of friends who join me and I've had different guests with me and um, talking and it's just that it's it's a I know there's a thing called drum hangs but it's literally a hang where mm. we can uh, we just get together and the great thing is everyone sort of checks in online on, on the screen and writes comments and we just have a chat and, and the thing I'm really uh, specific about is making sure that you know anyone that speaks or answer, ask a question or talks or passes a comment, make sure because I've got this software now where I can put a little comment on the screen and we can talk about it. Um, so it's really good. And um, I was really surprised that I've had um, set, certain friends along to talk. I mean, Pete Cater has been uh, been along. So you, you want to be careful because you guys are going to get roped, roped in as well at some point soon. So. <laughs> he's, run, he's running out of guests. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> I've got, a, <laughs> I've got a very long list. Everyone, everyone wants to be on my show. Of course they do. Oh, of course I want to be in your show, but I know you're running out of guests now. That's no. fine. That's okay. No, I'll take no, it. No, no, I'll you, take now it. You, now, you, now, you've just, now you've just taken the wind straight on my sails. And <laughs> I'm really inspired by, um, you know, you spoke earlier on about the, the playing and the flow and the dynamics and all of that. I'm just inspired by these guys who just play music and just have that. And I really love the thing about Steve is that everything is just super controlled and he plays exactly what he's mm. like on holding a conversation. He says yeah. what he means. He means what he says. He plays what he means and means what he plays. And I really yeah. like that. It yeah. Makes laugh. And it's also yes. really contained in a beautiful volume. Can you tell us about your book? Well, I can do. Yeah, it's um, it's still a work in progress, but basically, what it's all based, what is basically what it's based on, is uh, my studies with um, Joe Morello. Now, I know there's already a book out about that, but what I've come up with is an idea using pages five, six, and seven from Stick Control. But I've changed the stickings so that we now have a hundred stickings in a slightly different format. But it was initially, tr to be honest, triggered by um, working through those exercises. And it's all different ways of working with those stickings, firstly on the practice pad, then on the drum set, and then totally creatively. So it's in three sections. 
Nice. Um, so without giving uh, the content away, that's the basic formula for the book. Um, and it's effectively uh, like a binary solution um, for playing so that actually right and left could mean anything really. So it could mean right hand flam, left hand flam. It could even mean right hand paradiddle, left hand paradiddle or, or whatever and different ways of working it around the drum set. So it's a system really. Great. Nice. Cool. Looking yeah, forward to this I've one. Been well, it's been sort of stuff that I've been working working on really that's sort of been formulated over the last 35 years. Um, I was really fortunate. Um, it would have been, how old am I? 45 now. So it would have, at the age of 18, I used to write these columns for Rhythm Magazine called Practice Made Perfect. And they used to publish these little magazines and uh, an educational supplement. And um, so some of the exercises from there, because even today, people have said, oh, I still remember those series of exercises that you used to write every month for rhythm. And uh, so some of them are based very loosely uh, around there, but just sort of, you know, we're talking 20, 30 years on now. So <laughs> it's, it's an expansion of that. Cool. cool. Sounds great. Well, oh, well, it's good to see you guys. And thank, thank you. you it's good to see you too. Me. Unfortunately, this is all the time we have. Uh, thank you for, for joining us. And, you know, it's so nice. It's just like drummers are great, aren't they? Like, I feel like you're such a good example because you come on and you're like so humble and like, oh, and you're just an incredible player and you're putting on these gigs and there's just no like front, you know, it's just nice. You're just like, it's, good, it's family, isn't it? Isn't it? It's family. Real it family. is. And that's, I think that's the important thing as well. I think even now with the way we are, you know, unable to do gigs, um, it's difficult more so than ever. We need to support each other. I've had my moments mm -hmm. where I've said to you, you know, I doubted my playing. I think, am I relevant? Am I old hat? Am I this? Am I that? And, you know, what is it? You know, why don't I have any more followers on Instagram? What, you know, those kind of stupid things we mm -hmm. have in our back of our mind. And, it's all mental health, isn't it? And it is a it is an issue at the moment for everybody, uh, to various to varying degrees. I think. True. Uh, Definitely. So I found that the the live stream actually has been a really good way of me and doing this now is therapy, isn't it? In a way, you know, for for us all. It certainly yeah. has been therapy for us, no doubt about it.